In this video, I'm going to discuss the basic information we often want to collect when we start our security analysis. So I'll talk about the importance of mosaic theory, and then I'll briefly discuss financial ratios and financial statement analysis. And then finally, I'll discuss other information that you would often want to pull before you start doing any valuations. Now, mosaic theory is this theory that involves collecting public information in order to determine the underlying value of a company's securities. The goal behind Mosaic Theory is to collect a very large amount of information from a variety of sources. Now, if you're not familiar with what a mosaic is, a mosaic is a picture that's comprised of lots of little tiles. And when you put them together, they form a picture. So they were, these are very popular during the Roman period. Here's an example of one of the most famous mosaics, one that was found in Pompeii during the excavation. Uh, so beware of dog. So as you can see, one of these tiles or a few of these tiles together, they don't mean anything. You're not going to be able to get the full picture. But put them all together, and you get a better picture of what is going on here. And so this is the idea behind mosaic theory. You take all of these pieces of information from a variety of sources, and it allows you to get a better sense of what's really going on with respect to a stock or an industry or a market as a whole. Now, analysts rely on mosaic theory to essentially put together information that they probably couldn't have assembled without collecting data from non-public sources. So by putting this information together, you might be able to glean some information that hasn't been stated publicly by the company, but is pretty obvious when you have all the data or all the publicly available data. Now there's a variety of sources that you can use to collect data for an individual security. Financial statements are a great resource. These are obviously going to contain historical data, but sometimes, especially with the firm's 10K or annual report, you can get a sense of current information or what might happen in the future. So here's an example of one of Apple's most recent annual reports. If I scroll down to the content section, what you're going to see are all of the standard items that typically are included in a, an annual report. If I go down to item number seven, this is where we're going to find management's discussion and analysis of financial conditions and results of operations. Now, this section details the management's analysis or overview of the company. So how is it done in the past? So in the last fiscal year, uh, how is it likely to do in the future? Uh, maybe the management gives us some indication of where the company is likely headed. So of all the sections in the annual report, this is very often the most value relevant. It's the section that if you're going to make a recommendation on uh, whether to buy, sell, or hold, this is the section that you would want to spend a very large amount of time on. So we have information on a breakdown of the company's sales by region, so the Americas, Europe, uh, Greater China, uh, Japan, the rest of Asia Pacific. We have a huge amount of information on specific products like the iPhone, the iPad. And then we also have a large amount of other information on uh, a further breakdown in different geographic areas, so Greater China, for example. Now, there are other sources that you could read. So, for example, if you wanted to read earnings call transcripts, those would absolutely be worthwhile. On the Bloomberg terminal, you can get a printout of those, or you can often listen to the, the actual call itself. Uh, those can provide valuable information, not just because of what's in them, but also the management might face questions from uh shareholders or analysts asking them very pointed questions about where is this firm headed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that information could be valuable to you as you put together a research report. Now, in addition to the annual report and earnings call transcripts, we have some other tools in, at our disposal. Uh, one of these tools, the most basic of these tools, is to use common size financial statements. 
So once we have the financial statements, what we can do is we can compare past performance of our firm to, well, the historical performance in prior years, or we could even compare that, that performance to the performance of that firm's direct competitors. So let's start with horizontal common size analysis. In horizontal common size financial statement analysis, we scale all line items by whatever the base year value is. So if the base year of, let's say, total assets is one, every future year is going to be some percentage of one or 100%. With vertical common size financial statement analysis, this is where we divide all of the line items on a financial statement by some uh, other line item. So for the balance sheet, it's going to be total assets. And for the income statement, that denominator is going to be total sales or total revenue. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have the CS company. And we have some information on it, several line items from 2008 to 2013. So what we'll do is we'll show the historical common size balance sheet, and then I'll show you the vertical common size balance sheet. Now the horizontal common size balance sheet, it takes whatever our base year is, in this case 2008, and sets it equal to 100%. Any value in the future is going to be some percentage of that 100%. So if we had $400 of cash in 2008, and we had four hundred and four dollars in 2009 that four hundred and four dollars represents one hundred and one percent of our value in 2008 so this gives us a sense of by how much each line item is growing year over year so obviously we can see that our our net ppe is growing faster than our our cash and our intangibles with vertical common size balance sheets again it's uh, basically we're dividing all line items by, well, in this case, our total assets. Uh, so remember, this is always going to be our denominator with vertical common size balance sheets. So here, every line item is a percentage of total assets. So that $400 of cash in 2008, we divide that into 6,500 during the year, and that's how we get this, well, 6%. So this gives us a sense of where our largest assets are, and uh, also on the, the right-hand side, where our largest liabilities are. So here we see a, a relative decline, a slight decline in inventory, and a slight decline in cash, but a slight increase in net PPE over time as a portion of total assets. Okay, so once we've put together our common size financial statements, the next thing I like to do is collect my ratios, the ratios for my firm versus other firms, or my firm's ratios uh, this year versus prior years. And the thing is, this video is meant to be more of a, a review video. I mean, obviously, if you're in my class right now, this is certainly something you've already looked at at least in two or three other classes in our, our finance curriculum. So I'll just briefly go over the basic ratios, uh, but you can also find these in our appendix slides and then also the, the ratio analysis Word document that you'll see on our Canvas page. So what I've done is I've broken my ratios down into about six categories. We'll start with liquidity ratios. Our most basic liquidity ratios are the ones you see here. So uh, the current ratio is just current assets divided by current liabilities. The quick ratio is just our current assets minus the, the least liquid of the current assets, which is inventory all divided by current liabilities. And then lastly, our cash ratio is just our cash plus any short-term investments like uh, CDs or uh, one-year T-bills or something like that, all divided by current liabilities. Uh, so we usually want to have at least one or two of these uh, anytime we're, we're analyzing the firm's liquidity. Next, we have the activity ratios, or sometimes these are called efficiency ratios. And not every firm is going to have a value for every single one of these. If your firm is a, a firm that provides services, it's probably not going to have cost of goods sold. So for some of these ratios that involve inventory or cost of goods sold, we wouldn't have those ratios. But the one efficiency ratio that you'll always be able to calculate is going to be right down here, our total asset turnover. Uh, total sales divided by total assets. 
And the higher this number is, the more efficiently the firm is using its assets to generate sales. So we, we like to see a very high total asset turnover number. Next, we have leverage ratios. And there are a fair number of these. Uh, we sometimes call these solvency ratios. Uh, some of the most prominent are the debt to equity ratio. Uh, so long-term debt divided by shareholders equity. Uh, as a side note, although I'm showing you some formulas here, different analysts will use different formulas. So as long as you're consistent with how you calculate these ratios, uh, you're always going to be fine. Some people choose to use long uh, total liabilities uh, divided by shareholders equity or total debt divided by shareholders equity. Uh, quite frankly, you just need to be consistent. I, I tend to prefer total liabilities divided by shareholders equity just because that, that'll account for all the, the liabilities of the firm. And there's different ways. I mean, there's not just debt. You have uh, all kinds of leases and whatnot. We can also have the equity multiplier. And the equity multiplier is just total assets divided by shareholders equity. But the one that I tend to prefer the most is our debt to total assets ratio. Uh, the reason I like to use this one is because this is almost always going to be between zero and one. Uh, it, unless you have negative shareholders equity, this thing will always be between zero and one. And then in our numerator, a lot of people like to use long-term debt. Again, I like to use total liabilities or total debt divided by total assets. Those make a little more sense than uh, long-term debt to me. Now, in addition to these early leverage ratios, we can have leverage ratios that tell us how able we are to pay off our interest on our bonds. One of the most important of these is the tie ratio or the times interest earned ratio. This is what we call coverage ratio. And as a rule, we like to see this be, I mean, fairly high. We don't want to see it down at the two to three level or even lower than that, because that means that we might not have enough earnings before interest and taxes or EBIT uh, to be able to pay off our interest expense in a given year. If we get a tie ratio of like 1.5, this might mean that we, we just don't have the ability in coming years to be able to pay off our interest expense on our bonds. All right, next we have profitability ratios. And these obviously, just like a lot of the other ratios you've already seen, uh, but the net profit margin is just net profit after taxes divided by sales. ROA is uh, net profit or net income divided by total assets. And then ROE is net income divided by shareholders equity or uh, book equity. Now, the ROE here can be decomposed into uh, something called the DuPont decomposition or the DuPont equation. And what we can do is we can take that net income divided by shareholders equity and we can separate it into these three ratios. So the ROE can become equal to the profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. And the reason we often like to do this is because it allows us to see where our profitability, where our ROE is coming from. If our ROE is less than that of our competitors, why is it less than that of our competitors? Are we not levered enough? Are we less efficient with our total assets? Or is our profit margin on every dollar of sales just lower than that of our competitors? All right, next we have valuation ratios. And valuation ratios uh, essentially involve a, a market value metric scaled by some additional metric. So our, our classic valuation ratio is the P.E. ratio or the price to earnings ratio. Uh, we have two main P.E. ratios, the forward P.E. ratio, where we have the price per share on top, divided by expected earnings per share or EPS over the next 12 months in the denominator. Uh, so this one, it gives us a sense of current price of the company's stock per share divided by our, our expectations. Uh, we can also have the trailing P.E. ratio, and this is just price currently per share divided by earnings per share over the last 12 months. Uh, this is essentially sometimes called our historical P.E. ratio. The higher these ratios are, these valuation ratios are, the more valuable the company is, we often say. 
Uh, so if we have a company with a PE ratio of 100, let's say that's the, the company's trailing PE ratio of 100, what that says is that shareholders are willing to pay $100 per share for every dollar of historical earnings per share. That indicates that investors believe that this firm will generate a lot more earnings per share in the future than it currently is. So in essence, this PE ratio, along with a lot of these other valuation ratios, can be thought of as a measure or a proxy for growth prospects of the company. Uh, we have a couple other valuation ratios. The market to book ratio is another good one. It's just the market price of the stock. So I think market cap divided by book price of the, of the stock. So in this case, shareholders equity. On a per share basis, this is just the current share price divided by the book price per share. Uh, and then we have several other ratios that all kind of say the same thing. Uh, price to operating cash flow, uh, price to sales. So this could be price per share divided by sales per share, or it could be market cap divided by total sales. We can also have the EBITDA ratio. And the EBITDA ratio, it gives us a sense of the overall firm value divided by one of our most basic profit measures. So in the numerator here, we have the enterprise value, which is our market cap plus the book value of debt minus cash. Uh, so this entire thing is our formula for enterprise value. Technically, this should be market value of debt. The problem is, you know, it's really hard to get an estimate of market value debt. And it's usually, unless the firm is close to bankruptcy, pretty close to the book value of debt. So we often just sub in the book value of your total debt right here. Uh, and then in the denominator, we have EBITDA, or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. All right, and then finally, we have payout ratios. Uh, our most basic payout ratio is the dividend payout ratio. So dividends per share divided by earnings per share. Uh, although we can also have the, we also have the dividends per share ratio, and that's just dividends paid out over the past year per share of stock. So yeah, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. So that was a an extremely quick coverage of our basic ratios. Uh, we're going to collect a lot of these in our uh, data collection in this class. So uh, I, I figure, you know, you're already familiar with them. Let me just show them to you again very, very quickly. Okay, so when we do collect ratios, we could go out on a Bloomberg terminal or Yahoo Finance or Morningstar or some other data website uh, and collect that data. The best place, however, to get that data is often a source that's already collected the ratios and put them together for us. So in class, we're going to use this template. It's so this XLTP is the signal for a template in Bloomberg, and XIDF is the financial statement template. So we're going to pull out this template, and that'll give us pretty much every ratio that we need. Uh, basically, we don't want to have to waste time collecting these ratios ourselves and calculating them. The big goal in analysis is on interpretation and comparison. Uh, we can also use the FA function to collect a lot of other uh, useful data, including common size financial statements uh, and maybe some other specialized ratios that aren't in this template. But these are going to be our two big sources for collecting financial statement information. Now, there are going to be some ratios that are not in those two sources. And for that, we're going to use two particular functions. Uh, the RV function, which is the relative valuation function, and the EQRV function, which is the, the equity relative valuation function. Uh, both of these are going to contain a lot of our valuation ratios. These will allow us to compare our firm's valuation ratios to those of their direct competitors, and then also the historical value of those ratios. Now, there are some other pieces of information we often want to collect on our firm. Uh, so, for example, I've talked about short interest in some previous lectures. Uh, we do want to know what the short interest on a particular stock is. Uh, that'll give us the a sense of what percentage of investors currently believe the stock is overvalued. We can also 
graph almost any ratio or any line item on the balance sheet or income statement using the GF function. Uh, so this is a pretty useful function to examine exactly, uh, let's say, how a ratio is performing through time uh, for one firm, and we can even compare this number with uh, that of a firm's direct closest uh, peer firm. Now, what I've just shown you is kind of like the bare basics of the information that we want to collect. There's actually a lot of other factors that we often want to consider in uh, our most basic security analysis or financial analysis. For example, what political and regulatory risks does this firm face? I mean, if our firm is a multinational and it operates in both the United States and China and there's conflict or potential conflict, uh, between those two countries, that might alter the choices or the decisions that our firm's management will make. We want to know our exposure to each of those markets. We also want to know something about the firm's strategy, so how does it actually make money and how can it continue to make money uh, without being uh, essentially forced to compete on cost and running a, a very, very, very thin profit margin. Uh, we also want to know something about the uh, Porter's Five Forces as they relate to our firm. So Porter's Five Forces, generally they focus on the industry and the forces that affect that industry, but these are going to be very important for us in financial analysis. And then finally, we want to know something about the corporate governance of the firm. And I, I know I've talked about corporate governance in the past, but corporate governance, it does give us a sense of how effective the board and the shareholders are of reining in management and making sure that management behaves in a, a value maximizing manner uh, for the shareholders. All right, so with that, I'm going to summarize. Uh, essentially, in security analysis, we want to assemble a very, very large amount of information. Uh, using a large amount of information from a variety of sources, both the ones including in this video and then other sources, uh, we're going to get a better sense of what is going on with our firm. We use analysis techniques like peer group analysis and time trend analysis to examine the performance of our firm relative to its past performance and also its perform uh, the performance of its peers. And then finally, Sometimes graphing a lot of the ratios or line items can illustrate exactly what's going on with a firm. So we can use the GF function in Bloomberg if we want to. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and I hope you found this very, very brief summary of financial statement analysis useful. If you do have questions, obviously please feel free to reach out to me, but if you don't, I'll see you in class. Thank you.